I am so thrilled to introduce our next speaker. As a child of the 80s, I thought I knew Timmy Mallet from Wackaday in polka dot bikinis. However, having just finished his book, I now know that as well as being an utter TV legend, he's also an accomplished artist, a keen cycle tourist and tells a great story. In his book, he cycles from his home in the UK to Santiago de Compostela and back, following the Camino de Santiago, which is one of the pilgrimage routes which crisscross Europe and converge on the Spanish city. He paints remarkable pictures en route on an easel mounted on the back of his bike, and the book is really clever at weaving together a narrative of his journey with snippets from his own life, in particular memories of his brother Martin, whose funeral is held a couple of days before he steps off. As well as including lots and lots of fascinating historical details, Timmy talks in the book about the need for us all to achieve our potential. And this is a message which really resonates with me. The ability of a bike ride to broaden our horizons, both metaphorical and literal. I'm really, really looking forward to hearing more about his journey in this talk. So finally, Timmy, a huge welcome to the Cycle Touring Festival and over to you. I'll tell you what, Laura, this has been a brilliant festival. Just lovely. I have loved watching all these great stories and presentations about cycle rides all over the place. And it just makes me want to get out on the bike and go exploring. The family have been watching here and just thinking, hey, isn't this great? Everybody else is dreaming big dreams as well. So what I'm going to do tonight is uh, share a story about uh, a big bike ride. Well, big bike ride for me. For others, you know, lots of people have cycled much bigger things. I mean, Laura and Tim have cycled around the world. Yes, amazing. But you know, wherever you get out on your bike, it's not how far you go or how fast, it's how much fun you have along the way. And there's a lot of fun to be had. So uh, I'm going to see if I can share my screen and see if I can work this out. Uh, one second, I shall just do a little click like that. And then let's see if this works. And I go, hello, yay, is that working? Perfect, good. What you're looking at here is a map of Europe with an awful lot of lines on it. And those are the lines of journeys and routes to Santiago de Compostela. I'm going to say that again. It just sounds really good. Santiago de Compostela in northwest Spain. It's an ancient pilgrimage route that's been around for a thousand years. Actually, it's more than that. It's probably a squillion years. And my story tonight is going to be about history, some art and some stories. Um, and some of this may just surprise you because you're probably more used to seeing Timmy Mallet um, looking like this. Yeah! I'm the man with the mallet, not always on a bicycle, but a mallet, certainly. There's me and Kylie playing Mallet's Mallet on Wackaday. Uh, what fun. And she's just won the wacky plus and saying, I should be so wacky. Got a little question for you. What have Kylie Minogue and Timmy Mallet got in common? I'll give you a clue. Bomb ballerina are number one. Here's itsy bitsy teeny weeny yellow polka dot bikini. Oh, yeah. Good mommy. Well done, Timmy. Thank you. Yeah, uh, itsy bitsy teeny weeny yellow polka dot bikini. They're just showing the charts from 1990 on the BBC Four at the moment on old Top of the Pops. And uh, lo and behold, uh, I'm number one from 1990, which is great. It's very exciting to see it. And finally, actually just to see the show going out and thinking, oh, look at that. That's what we did. Hey, what fun. And when I'm not doing uh, uh, on stage with a mallet or singing itsy bitsy, I'm doing this. I'm an artist, and uh, sometimes I even get some of the paint actually onto the canvas. <laughs> yeah, I love art. I've always loved art. It's about storytelling. You know, on Wackaday, I would take my paints with me, and if we were ever short of the story, the director would say, paint us a picture to me and tell us what you're doing. So what I really want to do is to cycle the Santiago de Compostela route 
and paint it as I go. And is that going to be possible? I don't know. Got to do a bit of practicing, a bit of prep. Always a good idea to do some rehearsal and trying things out. So I've packed up two panniers and I've got a dry bag with my art materials in. And I'm cycling up the hills of the Chilterns in the rain at winter and thinking, yikes, this is going to be a little tricky. And then at uh, beginning of February, I got a lovely little delivery. Ooh. Wow. Wow. Be interesting cycling it like that. <laughs> yeah, I've got an e bike, a Timmy e bike, and having an e bike transforms your cycling. It's just the best thing ever. You still got to pedal, you still got to ride, but it just makes things a little bit easier. And one of the most noticeable parts of this is. When you come around the corner and you see a great view and you think, oh, I'm going to take a photo of that. And then you see there's a hill coming up and you've got your momentum going and you think, oh, I'll leave that alone. I'll wait till the next time. Let me tell you, there's never, ever, ever a next time. It's always about being in the moment. Reaching your potential is being rooted in the here and now. And so an e-bike, a Timmy e-bike, makes it easier and me and my pals are loving how the e-bike riding is transforming things this is a giant explore one 2018 model and it's just transformed the uh, ability to do this camino this pilgrimage now a pilgrimage yeah it's an ancient route that's been around forever and uh, back in the Middle Ages, in the dim and distant past, when Chaucer was writing his Canterbury Tales, roughly a quarter of a million people would set off from their home to Santiago de Compostela every year and make their way there and back again. A quarter of a million. Now that is a lot of people traveling all over Europe, questioning things, asking what's going on in the world? How am I gonna get on with the people, with the manners, with the customs, with the food, with the weather? How am I gonna manage it? And why am I doing it? Well, often they'd be doing it for a cure for their condition because they'd be heading to Santiago de Compostela to the cathedral where the bones of St. James the Apostle are buried. St. James was the brother or cousin of Christ. And so it's a hugely important uh, venue to get to. And all of the saint is there. All of him, apart from one little thing, his left hand. His left hand's not in Santiago de Compostela. Back in the early years of the 12th century, the hand of St. James was given as a wedding present to the 12 year old Matilda, who was the granddaughter of William the Conqueror. A wedding present, a hand. When her husband passed away, she headed back to her daddy, Henry I of England, who said, that's great. I'll put that in my brand new abbey in Reading. And for the next 450 years, Pilgrims flocked to Reading to see the hand of St. James. Then, of course, the dissolution of the monasteries happens, Henry VIII, and uh, the place falls into disrepair, and it's lost for several hundred years. Good story, this lasts forever. And then it was discovered by workmen making way for the brand new building in Reading, Reading Jail. And it got sold to a collector 
who put it into somewhere on the Thames Valley. And right now it's in St. Peter's Church in Marlow in Buckinghamshire, just a few miles from where I live. And this is amazing. Hang on a second. If the hand of St. James is just around the corner, you know, a, a morning's bike ride, why on earth would I be going to Santiago de Compostela when I can just go around the corner? So let's go and have a look at this hand, shall we? You ready to see it? Yeah. The hand of St. James. Ooh, uh, misses. It's blue because it's in that glass container and it's kept in a cupboard. But I saw it like this and you can see that this hand, which is very, very old, was not uh, cut from the arm. Uh, it's rather gruesome, but if you look down here, you can see the tendons. This hand was ripped off the body and the hand of St. James has been in England for the last 900 years. Wow. And that's when my pal said, hey, why don't you take a photo of the hand of St. James and put it as close as you can to the tomb of St. James in Santiago? Oh, yeah, that's a good idea. So that gives me reason to go to Santiago. <clears throat> Just a minute. How did pilgrims do this journey quarter of a, you know, quarter of a million years ago, a thousand years ago? Well, they would have got permission from their lord of the manor and their parish priest. You had to have permission because often you'd be going, as I say, to get cure for your condition or, you know, are you running away from your responsibilities? Have you paid your bills and all that sort of stuff? So I thought, well, I'll go and get permission and a bit of encouragement from the bishop. And here's the Bishop of Oxford. Uh, it looks like a glorious morning, doesn't it? Uh, it's the early February and it's, I think, one degree. It was bitterly cold. And uh, he gave me lots of encouragement and said, hey, good on you. And when you get to Santiago, invite the Archbishop to come and visit us because we've got a connection. Then I got a nice letter from the Archbishop of York. And I wrote to um, Prince William, because I live in the Royal Borough and Prince William wrote a lovely letter back to me saying, good luck. I could also read the underside, which was, you're probably bonkers, Mallet, but good luck. This is a terrific thing to do. And then I wrote to my MP and my MP said, I'd like to um, come and hear your story, which was a bit of a surprise because at the time she was prime minister uh, dealing with Brexit. So Theresa May came to my house to hear about my Camino and to sign my pannier and to look at the bike and the paintings and say, wow, Mallet, that's a bit of a thing that you're doing. And I said, well, I want to see if it's possible to reach my potential and to paint this adventure as I go. And I'm inspired by my brother, Martin, my Down syndrome brother, Martin. She said, I know about your brother. And just like him, all we have to do is to be the best that we can be. Wow, what a, what a generous thing to say. I'll introduce you to Martin now. <clears throat> Here's Martin Mallet, my big brother. I've got two big brothers, big brother Paul and big brother Martin. And Martin's here, we're playing dominoes in the pub. Uh, he's put his arm on my shoulder over there because you can see I'm cheating. And he's a painter too. Look at that lovely painting he's doing. It's great, but he's also a cyclist. And Martin and I love to cycle together. Here we are on the Deeside railway line in Aberdeen. And I love this picture because he's not thinking about where he's going or where he's been. It's about the here and now of pedaling, the business of moving those pedals. Hold this photo in your mind because this is Martin rooted in this and we're cycling together. Yeah, brilliant. And I told him about my trip. <clears throat> This is the last photo I've got of Martin, because just a week before I set off on my Camino, dear Martin died of dementia, wretched disease. But that smile, wow, what a mallet smile, isn't that lovely? And at his funeral, my big brother Paul um, found these, I'll show you. 
see this, a Martin Mallet name tag. And he said, I wonder if you can use these and uh, somehow or other use them to mark your journey. I thought, oh, that's an idea, that, 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 that could work. So um, that's what I did. Hang on. Um, yeah. So I left them in places along the Camino, like a vineyard. Going to be a very, very good crop of wine that year. That'll be a good vintage. Or it, under a statue of St. James in a church, a wayside marker in a castle. Martin Mallet name tags all across Europe. And each day I'd have a little Martin Mallet moment. Martin was a bell ringer in his local church and just seemed to be a very special thing to do. So this is my route and you can see numbers on my route uh, and each of those numbers refer to where the Martin Mallet name tags are all across Europe. And in my book, uh, <laughs> the pink end papers, very pink, look at those. Uh, you can see where each of the name tags is because I've got the what three words code, which refers to the GPS. What three words is a great app that can identify exactly where you are in the world from three words. It breaks up the entire world into just a few, uh, into little squares of a couple of meters apart. It's a brilliant, brilliant thing. <clears throat> So if you want to follow this journey, you can from the comfort of your own home on just reading the book. Or, and then if you punch in those what three words, that will show you the exact side of the road, what part of the building Martin Mallet name tags in. And if you ever want to do it yourself and cycle that route, if you come across one of those name tags, let me know. Leave it there, but let me know. So that's the idea <clears throat> to cycle across Europe. Are you ready to go? All set. We've got our Timmy bike. We're all packed up. Let's go. Ah, forgot to mention the weather. I went in 2018 and the beast from the east had hit. It actually arrived on the 22nd of February. That's tomorrow. Ooh, uh. And we got that tremendous storm, floods, uh, snow, ice, just unbelievable right across Europe. And it didn't clear until the 7th or 8th of March, and I'm setting off um, on the 14th, 15th of March. Yikes. So I go down to my um, local church where I'm seen off by a, a bunch of hardy people who turned up to say, good luck. Can you hurry up? Because we want to go in and get warm and have a cup of tea. And both the bishop and the parish priest gave me a blessing. God bless them. Uh, said, good luck. And the blessing worked. Well, about a mile. I'm a mile into my journey and the chain snapped. Now, what? The chain snapped? Uh, I, I, oh. And I'm standing there forlornly in the rain looking at my bike I'm on the phone there phoning up Paul at Flat Harry's and saying can you help me and he's laughing and come out to fix the chain he said that should do you I said, what do you mean should <laughs> I want more than should please uh, see how you get on and that first day I don't know what it was but there was a broken chain there were floods uh, along the I've got a good route here but I can't get oh flooded now hang on or thick deep mud but there's also daffodils, beautiful, glorious daffodils. You know, we have more daffodils in Britain than anywhere else in the entire world. Britain has more daffodils and more bluebells than 
any other place on the planet. And they're there, cheering me on and making me feel good. Wow, my pal Stevie's with me on these first few days. He says, just keeping an eye on your mallet, you're probably going to need to because you're all over the place. Yeah. Go down through Winchester. The crocuses are out. Aren't they beautiful? Look how big the cathedral is. Look between those trees. Can you see me? I'm there on the bike. That's me. I painted myself in. And headed down to Portsmouth and caught the ferry over to San Marlo. And then straight away into France, there's a big, massive sky, a huge sky, which reminds me that this is an enormous journey. Um, it's dwarfing me and the bike. There's something about this painted in with Prussian blue and burnt umber and a little bit of cerulean blue in the sky. That's watercolor. And I'm going, have I bitten off more than I can chew? But I'm wanting to stay here at Mont Saint-Michel, one of the great, wonderful uh, uh, UNESCO World Heritage Sites. It's there that um, I've got a family connection with this place because the Mallet family come from around this region and came over with William the Conqueror in 1066. So this is the only place I booked to stay on the entire journey. And I'm staying in the Pilgrim Hostel, which is right up the top of the one impossibly narrow street here. OK, and I've got to lug the bike up all these steps with all the bags and I'm grabbing hold of passers-by to help me. As I'm painting this view to remind me of this monumental building in this monumental sky and there's something about the hugeness of our adventure. I'm staying in a tiny little monk cell with pink, yeah, it's pink. I like that bedspread. It's a very Timmy color. You can see the door goes smack up against the wall. It's tiny. That's my view out onto the monastery. And uh, I wanted to paint this. This is a big painting, about five foot by four foot. And it's Mont Saint-Michel with me in it. I wanted to put something that was timeless and dated by putting the cycling artist in. I didn't paint this on the spot. I painted this back in my studio, but it reminds me uh, we're just passing through. It's just our turn. Passing through, make sure that what you do is nice. Be nice. There's a little uh, note about from St. James who says, you know, uh, be nice to people along the way and don't gossip too much. Okay. Um, this painting is called In the Moment, uh, and it's on the border of Brittany and Normandy. And I stopped my bike here because I saw the sunlight on the rooftops gleaming and glistening. And I love this backlighting uh, of the, the bike in silhouette. Uh, and it's a hopeful painting. There's, I'm stopping because I can, because I've got an e-bike and it's no problem to get going again. Because I'm wondering, I wonder what is around the corner this here in the middle of it and smashing it up whoa that is a great big piece of tree yeah. uh, uh, oh look at that yikes oh is that what it's doing oh look beetles huge Capricorn. big beetles capricorn what it's the capricorns capricorns well, they're pretty big and they're rather spectacular yeah. and they've eaten their way through the tree and that is the tree. It's absolutely massive. I think I better paint this. There's Georges and Philippe. That tree is 600 years old. It was a sapling when Henry VIII was on the throne and now it's being chopped up. It's not going to end up as a nice piece of furniture. It's just going to be firewood. So that big tree on the side there, don't get too cocky because it'll all end in an axe. And because I'm on my e-bike, I can stop and see this. If I'd been in a car, I wouldn't have been, able, I'd have to find somewhere to park. If I'm walking, it would have been out of the way to wander across a field to go and see what these blokes are doing. But I'm that inquisitive sort of person who wants to know what's going on. And here's the thing about being a pilgrim. Uh, being a pilgrim is planning to be vulnerable. That is an odd phrase, but it's 
it's the same for all of us when we're cycle tourists. To be vulnerable means, okay, I'm not sure what's going to happen today. If you're hungry now, you go to your fridge. If you're tired, you go to your bed. But each day you wake up thinking, where am I going to go? What am I going to do? Who, wh who am I going to meet? What am I going to eat? Where am I going to stay tonight? I don't know. And you come to a crossroads with a great big signpost that's bigger than the bike. And you think, I wonder where that road leads. And it leads to an historical hero of mine. I'm on the way of the Plantagenets. So I make a detour to go and see Eleanor of Aquitaine, who was one of the great, great figures of the 12th century. And I drew her sitting next to, uh, lying next to her husband, um, Henry II. And I'm reminded that at the age of 80, Eleanor got on horseback and went over the Pyrenees to do a diplomatic marriage. And I'm thinking, well, if she can go over the Pyrenees at age 80, I'm sure I can get over the Pyrenees on my Tim e-bike. So I asked her a little question down there. I said, hey, Eleanor, fancy coming on a bike ride with me? Do you know what she said? Yes, Timmy, I'm on the way. <laughs> What's wrong with this picture? Okay, look closely. I'm cycling over the wilds of France here and the big wide roads, which are a joy to cycle on. But if you look closely, I'm on the wrong side of the road. Don't tell my family. They said, whatever you do, stay on the right side of the road, Mallet. Oops. I got to my twin town, south of Poitiers called St. Benoit. My good friend, Dom and Sophie, are watching this evening in France. And thank you so much for the wonderful banner across the street. I love this. Go, go, Timmy, go. Here's my question. Is this encouragement or an instruction? Uh, the rain's come. It's a torrential bit of soggy weather. Remind me again. There is a reason for this. The wind is blowing a hooly. The rain is lashing. I've got another two hours of this. And why am I doing it? Oh, that's right. I don't <laughs> oh, great. Hey, do you ever take a selfie? You know, we've all got a phone. So I got my phone out and you take a selfie and you do this, don't you? Yeah. And you take a nice big smiley selfie. We all do it. My selfie that night was this. Just wanted to remind myself, this has been a tricky, tricky time. And the weather was so atrocious that often the track would just be washed away. I'm standing there thinking, what am I gonna do here? I've got to take a bit of a detour. Yeah, a massive detour. And my feet, yep, wrapped in cling film. It's wet. And when you're wet, soggy, and at a low ebb, you need to go and get a little snack and a drink. And as, as I'm sitting in a town having a little bit of refreshment, that I get a tap on the shoulder from somebody I know. How much have you done so far? I think I've done about a thousand kilometers, Lori. Wow. You are amazing. Oh. Amazing! How much further have you got to go? Oh, I don't know, another month or so. <laughs> and I love you that you're wearing the tie. Thanks, it's thanks. It's so nice, isn't it? Do you know, it's really, really special having you turning up like this. Thank you so much It's been for great. It's been really good. It's been so lovely to see you and I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of you for doing this and doing it for Martin. Thanks. And it's thanks, Lorraine. That was really special having that visit from Lorraine and her husband who were heading south and went out of their way to come and find me and to bring me an Easter egg and to give me some more boards to paint on and to take away some completed pictures. And uh, it was really special. I remember thinking to myself, friends, they just are your lifeline. Look after your friends, value them. Because when you're out, in the wilds of wherever on a big adventure. It's really nice to get a text, a phone call, or a surprise visit like that. I'm following the route of St. James, which is uh, scallop shells or yellow arrows, and they're all over Europe. But here in the middle of a roundabout, 
are these pilgrim statues all saying, Malik, you're going the wrong way. Off you go that way. I like the fact they've got a scallop shell on their staffs. Uh, but it just reminds me again, been around since Chaucer's time, maybe earlier. It's just my turn on this adventure. And here's where I'm staying along the way. I'm staying in different albergues or pensions or hostels. Um, down bottom right is where I stayed with the nuns. Uh, bottom left, a, a typical uh, albergue in Spain. Uh, top right, something wrong with the floor there. I'm sure that's slanting. That doesn't look very level, does it? I shared there with a, a, an Italian bloke who had really distinctive feet odors. Yeah. Uh, top left, that's a little pension that's owned by each of these towns that you go through in France and you just turn up at the town hall, you say, hello, uh, can I stay the night it's for a few euros? And they say, yep, and there's the accommodation. And I stayed here with Hans. Hans is in his seventies. He's from Switzerland. He's watching tonight. Hello, Hans. And uh, we share a bottle of rosé and a plate of baked beans and fried eggs and uh, he walks to Santiago every year, a different route. This year he started in Mont Saint Michel, he'd been going a month or so, and I'm the first pilgrim he's met along the way. And we've stayed in contact ever since. I like the way that you meet people and become lifelong pals just by spending uh, a shared experience like this. Now here's a track which seems to go on and on and on forever. All I can feel is the wind in my face and there's no features about this thing at all. If you look over my shoulder, you can see it just carries on like this forever. This is an everlasting road with wind, wind, wind. Ooh, tricky. So when I see a garden like this with real color, I stop, of course, to take a picture. It's a 10 second photo opportunity that leads to an act of random kindness because I'm, as I'm taking the photo, these voices behind me said, bonjour, monsieur, blah, 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 blah. And I turned around to find two women who spoke very good English and said, uh, oh, you're English, come and have a cup of tea and see the garden. And so I ended up painting Monel sitting there in her little chair by the uh, blue shutters and the purple wisteria. And uh, she read um, Serrano de Bergerac in French to me, which sounded fantastic. I didn't understand a word of it. And at six o'clock, I said, oh, I better pack up and head off and find somewhere to stay tonight. And Marie Lise, the mum, leans out the window and says, no, nope, there's a meal for you tonight and there's a, a room for you too. An act of random kindness that came about because I stopped to take a photo of some azaleas. Lovely. Hello, Monel. Greetings to the Rigaba family. And if ever you're on the Camino, watch out for their beautiful garden. Take a photo. They may even give you a cup of tea. Greetings from a very damp and soggy Timmy. I'm at the statue of Gibraltar. This is what I've come to see. It's where three of the main routes on the Chemin de Saint-Jacques meet. There's the way from Paris that I came this way. Um, then the Vézelay and Le Puy route. And they all meet here at this statue. And somehow I thought it'd be a little bit more exciting and impressive than this. And then we head off down that track over there, heading towards the Pyrenees and saint jean pied de port where I guess I may be able to dry out a little bit. I think to myself, I've been gone three weeks and three days now, left home via Oxford, Winchester, Portsmouth, ferry across to Saint Malo, Mont Saint Michel, down the way of the Plantagenets. Uh, I joined the way of tours um, south of Poitiers near Saint Jean d'Angely. Then I came down through Bordeaux to here and along the way I could count the number of pilgrims I've met on the fingers of one hand but I expect from here on in there's going to be squillions of us. wonder if they'll all be quite as damp as me. 
Uh, I'll just have a little sh show you a couple of little things here because I know what you're asking. You want to know how on earth I'm doing these paintings. That I'm, well, I'm carrying with me a, a, a dry bag like this, and inside it are some boards in a bag here. That's my watercolor pad, like that. There's the watercolors I'm working on, but these are for the uh, boards here foam boards uh, and acrylic paper for painting with the acrylic paints. The bag of acrylic paints looks like that. There's my brushes, just a set of brushes and a, a, quite a few, not many colors, probably about 15, I suppose, and uh, a palette like that for watercolors. I've got a little bag like that. That's it. That's what I'm carrying. And a sketchbook at the front. So. I'll just go through my little sketches as I'm going. So that's how it's done. And then those paintings are um, collected actually by um, Stephen Lorraine. They picked them up and took some home and the mayor of St. Benoit sent uh, some paintings home as well. So I was able to carry, I don't know, 30 to 40 boards, which sounds like a lot. But you know they're they're light and they pack nicely into that dry bag. Uh, I was talking about a tie. I, I wear a tie um, because Brother Martin wore a tie, and I'm collecting all these badges along the way. Can you tell? I'm a bloke who likes badges. Uh, along the way, it's very important to get your pilgrim passport stamped. So everywhere I go. I go into the uh, office of wherever it is and say, stamp my passport and then sign it. I get people to, to sign the stamp because it, it's not just a place I've been, it's a person I've met. And I want to be reminded of the people I've met along the way. My mapping is done with this. This is it, the old fashioned thing. That's what I'm following. These lines here across Europe, it, it's nuts, isn't it? You're doing that? Yep, yeah, I'm going across like that. I've got a GPS. I've got a, I use Kamut to plot a route based from that map of, of the towns I'm going to go through. And then I plug it into my Wahoo elements and, and follow that dotted line. Unless I think to myself, hey, I'm going to go off and explore somewhere different. Right. Um, let me go back to where we were. Where were we? Saint Jean Pied de Port. Uh, this is at the foot of the Pyrenees. Now, this is where the walkers start. Uh, and if you were to cycle just the Camino Frances the, the, across Spain, the idea is you think, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll fly into Biarritz and then take the train down to Saint Jean and pick up my bike there. You can't rent a bike in France and drop it in Spain. Don't know why they are both in the EU, but it's impossible. So my pal Gary, who says he wants to join me, has got to fly into Barcelona, take the train to Pamplona, pick up a bike in, Bar in Pamplona and cycle pre-planned and pre-knowing where he's going to stay. So we end up meeting just briefly for one evening. <laughs> Such a pal, it's lovely. But Saint Jean, it's raining, as you see down here, and that's the archway I'm going to head through to head up to the Pyrenees. Now, how am I going to get up the Pyrenees with all that gear on the back of the bike? I'm going to use my Timmy e-bike. Um, this is where the e-bike comes into its own. I've got it in uh, eco. Oh, it's only an eco. And I'm getting up here quite OK. Let's shove it up to normal. That's it. That's it. And. Uh, You can hear I'm breathing. <laughs> Talk again in a minute. This is what I'm seeing. I'm seeing misty mountain snow on the uh, peaks there. I've got few leaves clinging to the trees. And if you look closely, you'll see me in this painting twice. I'm down here on the right. I'm down there in yellow and I'm over there on the left in red. Yeah. So I've painted myself in twice on the way up to the top. Well, that feels like an achievement. Here I am at the top of the pass. And just down below me, you can see a couple of pilgrims climbing up the walking trail. But uh, the mountain thick with mist. And I'm very, very pleased. 
What an achievement. I really feel proud of myself. I've cycled up the Pyrenees. Wow! Now that is something else. Reach your potential, Mallet. Yes! I think I deserve a badge for that. I'm heading across from Pamplona to the Alto del Perdon, the Hill of Forgiveness, a particularly poignant point on, on the Camino Frances across northern Spain. Um, the wind turbines going whoop, 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 the rain coming, lashing. The track is just mud and these metal statues sway in the wind and there's a howling noise to them. It's bleak. And I'm really glad I saw it in those conditions because I'm reminded that this is not a jolly jaunt. This is not a holiday. This is a pilgrimage with a purpose to reach my potential, to make the most of every day and to paint it. And by painting is in my accommodation that night, I'm reminded that it's, it's something special. And I got dear brother Martin in my heart. Um, often we think that going on a cycle tour, you're heading to a town, but it's the villages that give you the most, we find. This little village called Hontanas, I'm stopping for the night because tomorrow I'm going to cycle up that mountain over there and I want to get my energy levels up. And there's a good reason to stop here. There's a bar, a bit of après ski and après cycle. There's also a rainstorm coming in. So I'll have my beer, please. And then the following morning, I will paint a little watercolor and leave it with the albergue. This is a great albergue. Secure lockup for your bike, heated floors in the showers, lovely uh, uh, accommodation in the dorms. Every single bed's got power, connectivity, you can get your Wi Fi. That night, a pilgrim meal, um, three courses, uh, as much wine as you can drink, 15 euros. By the way, got a tablecloth, cut glass, somebody's got a guitar, and they're singing to us. This is brilliant. And everybody in the village is employed in the Camino industry. There's a never ending stream of pilgrims. Uh, people need taxis to move their gear on to the next place. Uh, and it's all cash based. Pilgrims don't vote. It's great, great business, love it. This monastery I came through, it's called the Monastery of St. Anton. Often there's a little bar down the bottom where a bloke serenades you with a beer. But it reminds me of the reasons for doing the Camino. There are four, historical, physical, cultural, spiritual. Historical, it's been there forever. That monastery shows it. It's been a ruin for 500 years. Um, and we're just following in the footsteps of our predecessors. Physical, it's a long way. It's a bit of a hike. Cultural, what's the food going to be like? What are the manners? What are they saying? And then spiritual, you know, what's the meaning of life? And that's easy. It's a comfy bed, something nice to eat, and a bike that eases you up hills and gets you to the top without a puncture, please. I think I spoke too soon. This is very muddy. You don't want to come anything off the track here. And, uh, but you have to go extremely carefully. Who uh, misses? Um, perhaps I should have stuck with the road instead. Oops. I'm not the only cyclist on the Camino. I came across these two ladies, one on the left from Hungary with a fold up city bike. Wow! What's that for? I guess it's so she can get it onto public transport and get it there. She's cycling that route on that bike. That's amazing. On the right is Mariana from Holland. Mariana's in her 60s and she's pedaled from home on her bike. Wow, that is brilliant. Mariana is an inspiration. She just pedals and smiles. And she arrived into Santiago two days after me. And then she put the bike on the bus and the train, and took it home again. Wow. So you can do it. And look, she's even got a dynamo on the front. So she's always got one. 
I love this picture. I'm smiling. I'm happy. We're all happy when we're on a track like this. Off road, sun is shining. There's a warm breeze on your face and you're loving it. Hold on to that moment. Because tomorrow, it looks like this. There's an 18% descent, the rain on my glasses, there's gravel uh, bends and there's a bit of concrete. What are you gonna do? Tell me, would you cycle down that hill or would you walk it down safely? Come on, be honest. I know, me too. Of course I cycle down it. With the hands clawing on the brakes going, ah! <laughs> I'm painting and here's my easel. It's just the back of the bike. I've just set it up on the panniers there. That's it. I'm in a bit of shade. I'm using water. Uh, it's acrylic paint, which dries quite quickly. That's the good news. The bad news is it dries quite quickly. A and these paintings are all A3 size. That's the size of the picture. A cycling artist wearing a tie. It can only be Timmy Mallet. What do you think? Don Quixote. This is a, an image of Spain that I adore. The spin effects, the snow on the mountains, the spring cherry blossom. I've even signed my name down the bottom right in cherry pink. And this fella is taking the donkey, which has got his panniers on the side and a bucket on the back, all the way to Santiago. Wow, what's the name of your donkey? This is Salome, he said. Okay, what happens when you get to Santiago? I go home. What happens to Salome? Sausages. <laughs> I, hope he's, I hope it's a joke, please God it is. This is one of my favorite paintings. We're all on a journey. We're all making the best we can. And that's why I call it Don Quixote. Salome the donkey. This is the long and winding road that leads straight there. I'm in a standstone track now with um, olive trees and the mountains of Leon. I've come across the Meseta, the great plains of Northern Spain and I set up in the middle of the road to paint this picture and pilgrims are coming past me. Many are stopping to have a chat uh, and others are just hurrying past as fast as they could go. And I'm wondering why they're hurrying past because there's something to see and a conversation to be had. And anyway, up ahead, there's going to be a traffic jam. Meh. Meh. 20 minutes we waited while the sheep went across the road. And when I came to paint them, I found the way to paint it was to paint the light on the back of the sheep's back and then their legs. If you've got four legs, you've got the sheep. So let's count them. One, two, three. <sighs> Counting sheep always does that to us, doesn't it? Santiago, de Compostela, de Compostela, en la bicicleta, y para Santiago. This is the gorgeous Jose uh, singing to me above the uh, town of Astorga before I head off down this hill over here. I think he's brilliant. Well done, Jose! I think it's time I painted him. I love that smile. And he's just there to entertain pilgrims, to give us a bit of encouragement as we're going. Thank you. I'm heading up to the Iron Cross now, the highest point on the Camino. That's the walker's track and I'm on the tarmac because I, it, everybody said it's just a bit too rugged. And I thought, you know what? I don't need to prove anything. I've got my Tim e-bike. I'll go up, the, I'll go up the, the tarmac. Glad I did. Oh, look, there's another cyclist.
One Camino. Oh. E-bike. E-bike. So much easier with an e-bike. Do I sound smug? <laughs> Get a Tim e-bike. This is the Iron Cross. Big mound of stones. This huge, big, tall pillar dwarfing the people there. Uh, as I arrived, there's um, a bunch of German pilgrims um, saying uh, an open air mass. Wow. But it's a place of big significance. And this was my Martin Mallet moment that day. Now, this great big mountain of stones here must be hundreds of years old. There must be more stones from around the world here than anywhere else. Because traditionally, you brought a stone from home and you cast it here to uh, um, pay atonement, if you like, for your sins. I prefer to think of it as uh, counting your blessings. I brought my stone from home. Uh, you'll know it's mine because I painted it. <laughs> I brought it out of my garden and um, I'm going to count my blessings. So, most important thing, family, friends, health. Yep, I'm blessed with all of those. Uh, I've got a lovely family and uh, I'm going to give a little special mention to my uh, great son Billy, my lovely wife Linda, and my brothers, Paul, my big brother, who I'm blessed with, and Martin, who sadly died six weeks ago today. But uh, it's a lovely thing to remember them here and to think to myself, all I have to do is to reach my potential. So here we go. There it is, right there. You can see it easily. Tell me you can see it easily, because I can. Right, and then of course, whoops, <laughs> I brought a stone from Martin's home. And for 37 years, Martin lived in Newton Dee in Aberdeen. And this is a piece of gleaming, glistening granite from the gorgeous granite city of Aberdeen. And so, uh, Martin, you and me, there you go. And I hope that I can reach my potential just like you did every day of your life. And that's it. Stone from home, iron cross, highest point on the Camino. Great. Aren't we blessed? I think so. I'm coming into Santiago. I'm just past the iron cross, Pomforeda. The Camino Frances that most people take is, goes along this brown line here to Santiago. I'm going to come further south along Camino in Viano, this gray line here which was the route people would take to avoid the snow-covered peaks of O Sobrero. And it's only been signed in an official Camino route for about four years. So uh, I turned left at Pomparada, the uh, uh, Knights Templar city. And uh, from there into Santiago over the next four days, I met no pilgrims, not one. It was so empty. And this is what I saw, a beautiful river valley with the largest open coal mine from Roman era over here on the left. If you look closely, you'll actually see me here. I've painted myself in. Among the red poppies, there's a little red cyclist pedaling down the slopes there. That's me, yay! It's very rural. Here's the bloke collecting olive branches on his wheelbarrow. Wow, what a way to live. There's dignity in jobs well done, done with the best of our ability, no matter how modest they are. His pal is sharpening his scythe, sitting on a three-legged stool in his yard. Why hasn't he got a whippersnipper to cut the long grass? He's using the old technology. What's he wearing on his feet? He's got slippers, slippers on his feet. Why? Turns out they're easier to slide into the clogs that they wear. So we had a long conversation. I talked to him in English. He talked to me in Galithian. We didn't understand a word the other one said. And I painted him as he did that. <laughs> it's great. What a great day. And then the cattle are heading home. I was thinking about this because we're all at home. Here we are. East, west, home is best. 
and these cattle know the way. They're leading the farmer through the mountains and then whatever's going on back to security, safety, and the comfort of being at home. Painting, painting's called Heading Home. I've got to head, first of all, here. Santiago de Compostela. These big statues are about 15 feet tall and their arms aloft and they're smiling triumphantly, these pilgrims, because they're looking at the distant gleaming spires of Santiago de Compostela, 10K away, underneath that lovely evening sky. But first of all, there's gonna be a storm coming in, sleet, snow. Yeah, don't get too confident. The weather will always affect us. In Santiago, I go to the tourist office and say, what's your favorite view of the city? And they said, ah, most people go into the park, but if you go out to the museum two kilometers away, you'll get this lovely view of the spires and towers of the cathedral. And there's the terracotta rooftops in springtime, in the sunshine. This is what I've come for. I've cycled all this way for this. So this is it. Santiago de Compostela, the cathedral dedicated to St. James. This is what I've cycled. 2,430 kilometers to sea. It's the burial place of St. James. All of him is here, apart that is, from his left hand, which has been in England for the past 900 years. And I brought with me photos of the left hand of St. James to show to the tomb and to the Dean. I'm meeting the Dean of the Cathedral later on this afternoon. Here's the tomb. Silver. Behind that metal grill. I'm holding up the picture of the left hand to reunite the left hand and St. James, the rest of him. It's one of those little moments you think, if anybody could see what I'm doing here, they'd think that was rather odd. I don't. I like that connection with my home in Santiago. I like it very much. In the Pilgrim Mass, the thing we come to see is the Botafumerio that swings across the transept and it's billowing uh, all this lovely smelly incense. And the reason for this is back in the Middle Ages, it was to fumigate the smelly pilgrims. <laughs> I've had a shower since then, so. It, it's a great occasion and down the bottom you can see the ropes that are hauling on it, eight people hauling on this to bring it across. My pal Gary said, this is a true piece of theatre. This is what we've come to see. And he's right. It's an absolutely magical moment. But now I'm going to meet the Dean. The Dean of the Cathedral and the Archivist. The Archivist collects saints. Remember, I collect badges on my tie. I think he wins. And I show him the photos and the letters from the bishops, the archbishop, Prince William, and from Theresa May. And they say, Timmy, this year, 300,000 people will come into Santiago. It'll be 350,000 next year. And in a holy year, when the Feast of St. James lands on, July, on a Sunday, there'll be half a million, half a million people. He said, your pilgrimage, your Camino is gonna go into our archives. Wow. And then he says, by the way, when you see Theresa May, will you tell her to come and visit us? I love that. Great. I head to the coast to a place called Mushia. If you've seen the film The Way, this is where Tom Avery, played by Martin Sheen, scatters the ashes of his uh, dead son. And I put a Martin Mallet name tag in the chapel walls here and went on to Finisterre. So this is it, Finisterre, the end of the adventure. The Romans called it Finisterre, the end of the earth, because there's nothing beyond here except sea. Down in the town, I went to get my pilgrim passport stamped. And she was a lovely lady. She said, I've got something for you. She got me a certificate. Look at the name on it. Martin Mallet. My brother. Of K. 
carried Martin in my heart all the way for six weeks. This is just so special. I'm so proud. I think of that moment, that day, and that lovely, generous gift of the certificate for Martin Mallet, which hangs on the wall at my house. And I think about carrying him all the way in my heart. And the fact that last time I saw the sea was at Mont Saint Michel, it was blowing a blizzard, and then it's beautiful blue skies in Finisterre. And now I've got to turn for home because the family need my attention, as you can imagine. Uh, I'm down on the bottom left there, 46 and 47, finished there, and I'm going to make my way back through Santiago de Compostela, uh, over the mountains of Asturias, along the Camino Primitivo to Oviedo, along the Dinosaur Coast, which is the uh, Camino del Norte, to Santander, and then take a ferry over from the Bay of Biscay all the way back to, San, uh, to Portsmouth and then cycle up through the bar, bar gate at Southampton, through Winchester, Reading, uh, uh, Marla, and back to my um, village where I live. So I've got two weeks to do that. And that should be really straightforward, surely. Surely, that's quite straightforward. I'm, I'm noticing something here. I'm noticing on this little bit coming out of Santiago, I'm going a different direction. I'm going the other way. So I'm coming across these pilgrims face to face and I'm looking at them thinking there's an awful lot of them heading to Santiago. Now have a look at this. This is the crowd of pilgrims heading past on a busy day. And there's more coming and they just keep coming. See how everybody's wearing the scallop shell. Good way. Yeah, Buen Camino. Buen Camino. And they're all marching to Santiago. It, it's amazing. So far in the last um, hour, I've uh, counted, I don't know, 350, maybe 400 in an hour. It's an extraordinary number. It's a lot, isn't it? But you know, we're all on our own journey uh, and you don't feel like you're in a huge crowd. It's just, I notice them because I'm pedaling back the other way and thinking, Crikey by Jingo, there's a lot of people here. Get your courage up. Oh, if you look down on the right down here, there's one of the way markers with some stones on the top. That's it. That's what you're following all the way with the yellow arrow going off to Santiago. Oh, this is lovely. The sun's out. It's the first of May. Great. The wind turbines are going at the top of the mountain. That is snow. Don't get carried away. The moorland is bleak, it's desolate. My track takes me along here. And at this way marker, I heard that very familiar sound to all cyclists. Psst. My puncture, the only puncture I got in 3,750 kilometers the equivalent of Land's End to John O'Groats, back to Land's End, turn around and go up to Scotland again. That's how far it is. I get one puncture. Okay, it's on top of a mountain, yeah, in the rain, but I think I did pretty good on that giant Timmy bike. All right, I've reached the top of the pass, 1150 meters up. And as you can see, it's a great view. Can't see anything. It's nothing to see. And my glasses are just rained. Right, about 12 kilometers to the town. Hot drink needed. <laughs> There's a lot of rain on this journey, isn't there? Until this. You're telling me the sun comes out? Yes, it does. For some reason, this view is really reassuring. An orchard, a little chapel, beautiful sky. Oh, the world's okay. And on my final morning in Spain, I painted this. This is an allegory, I think, of my Camino. You look at the multi-colors in the 
field, the meadow in front of you. And that's all the different textures of each and every day, the people we meet, the conversations we have, the Zoom calls we take or whatever. And in the distance, there's the silhouette of our town, you know, where we live out our lives and meet people and do our work. And in the distance are the turquoise mountains of our dreams and aspirations, our hopes to cycle a big adventure somewhere. That's what drives us each and every day. That is my Camino Meadow. So here's what I did along the way. I got a question for you. Did I do my brother Martin proud? There's some more if you want to see more at my websites, two websites, timmymallet.co.uk, double L, double T. And that's where there's all sorts of stuff about what I'm up to. And on the right is my paintings malletspalette.co.uk. It's a good name, isn't it? <laughs> Who'd come up with that for mallet art to see my modern impressionist paintings? And then I'm on all the various socials, particularly like Strava, TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And if you uh, like it, there's a book. Yay! Utterly brilliant. My life's journey with many of the paintings in here in colour. And the things that we've been talking about on this adventure, this journey. Um, and, and if you would like a copy, you can buy it from anywhere, actually. It's published by SPCK. And you can get the book from any of your favorite bookshops. Or you can buy it from timmymallet.co.uk. And I'll do your special dedication and a little mention in the front. I'll write uh, something for you there. Maybe something about the festival, if you like. And I'll put in a sticker and something very special just for you as you've been on this lovely cycle touring festival. So if you go to timmymallet.co.uk, you can buy a signed and dedicated copy and it would be my pleasure and privilege to do that for you, okay? If it's art that you'd like to know more about, then you'll be pleased to know that I've done a limited edition of nine different images that I showed and talked about today along the way. And they are mounted or mounted and framed and they're all signed and they're just a limited edition. So something special perhaps to go on your wall if you'd like to have a little bit of mallet art. And that, dear Cycle Taurus, is it from me. So I'm going to say thank you. And uh, hopefully we've got dear Laura. Hello. Hello. Absolutely wonderful, Timmy. That was absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much for sharing your story. I'm glad we've put you on at the end of the festival because you've set the bar rather high. <laughs> it was, and and I will, and I'm, I'm being honest, I, I read a lot of cycle touring books and yours was a really good one. It really stood out. It's got, you've got a lovely story in there and it's, you've definitely done your brother proud. It's Thank a super you. journey, super story. Thank lots you. of, lots of love on the Q and A's for you. Um, lots of people saying how excellent your paintings are. And a couple of people had asked if they could buy your paintings before you uh, mentioned Mallet's Palette website. So um, yeah, lots of compliments on that one. Thank you. Well, if you go to Mallet's Palette, then there's um, the Camino paintings are, are on there uh, and the, the limited editions. And uh, I've actually done a number of um, commissions of the, uh, of some of those paintings that you saw tonight. Um, if you'd like your own version of that, then, you know, ping me an email there. That would be my pleasure to do that. Excellent, okay, okay. So there's, there is a, there's a question which I have, um, which I had thought of and somebody else has asked as well. You went in spring. I always think of spring in Spain as being rather nice. You had atrocious weather. Is there a reason you chose to go then? And was the weather as you expected? I mean, obviously, apart from the beast of the east, which nobody expected, did you know the weather was going to be quite so bad? No, of course not. No, the thing, actually, you're not the first person. First person to ask this was Mrs. Mallet, who said, <laughs> why aren't you going in September when it's going to be more guaranteed good weather? 
Uh, I said, I like the newness of spring. I like the fact that we see things coming out each day. I mean, I was out on my bike yesterday and I saw the crocuses are out. And, you know, I know that by the end of this week, the daffodils, more daffodils in Britain than anywhere else in the world, will be starting to flourish. And you think, yeah, this is going to be absolutely glorious. Well, I was expecting more colour, um, I have to say, uh, but then why should I? Uh, because there's a phrase, isn't it? The rain in Spain falls mainly on the cyclist. <laughs> uh, and uh, <laughs> that's true. It, it's the weather's weather, though, isn't it? Isn't it? Isn't it part of the, the rich tapestry of life? And and in some ways, I was talking about this with my pal Gary. He said, "Well, in some ways, it it makes it because if you can do that, you can do anything." Laura, when you cycled around the world, you had weather, and you go, "I can deal with it." Mm. I enjoy it. I enjoy being in bad weather sometimes because it makes you feel part of the world no not, not always as no. Long as you're ready for it. <laughs> sorry you're on your own there girl <laughs> uh, there's something about it though you feels like you're kind of yeah you're just part of the element it's not forever as long as you've got somewhere warm to go to at the end of the day mm. Mm. Yeah, you remember cycling through london in horrendous ra rainstorms and feeling making me feel alive because i knew i had a warm warm shower to get in at the end but, mm. um, there's a question here which i think is quite an interesting one and, and you, you obviously filmed quite a lot of pilgrims in groups on the way and you were cycling alone. So I'll read the question out, which is often the Camino is characterised as a time to form bonds with others as you travel together. I also cycled it alone. Did you find that solitary travel added to that sense of vulnerability that you mentioned? Uh, yes, I, I quite liked the solitary aspect of it because when I stopped to see Georges and Philippe chopping down the tree or stop to take a photo of the azaleas and have that act of random kindness. If I had been with somebody else, you'd have to say, excuse me, can you hang on? And you know that they'd be waiting there going, come on, Mallet's done it again. He's, he's taking more photos. He's, he wants to paint a picture. Oh, can't we just get there? Well, I'm not really bothered about the getting there. I'm a, more bothered about the let's be here. So, and I think the here is really lovely. You're right about the, the, the Camino being a shared experience. A lot of people do that, but I have also heard the same, the other thing is that uh, sometimes you go with an expectation that your traveling companion wants the same thing as you, and maybe they don't. Mm, absolutely. Someone suggested that you, you could call you could have called your book Preparing to be Vulnerable and they've said that they really like the way you spoke about that. And I think we, we discussed it when we were talking about you doing this session, didn't we? The idea of being on a bike, opening yourself up to the world and um, you do kind of instantly make yourself a bit more vulnerable being on the seat of a bike. Yeah, I think so. I, and I, 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 I'm also aware that there are only two things that you can rely on when you're at cycle touring. One is me. And the other is the bike. Right. So take care of this. Take care of the bike. Uh, and uh, uh, let's, I, I called the bike Martin. <laughs> I found myself talking, to him, come on, Martin, we can do this. Am I nuts? Yeah, 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 I am. Uh, but it was very reassuring. Uh, uh, and you see this a lot, you know, with cycle tourists who call their bike. Andrews, Andrew Sykes, who called it Reggie. You know, uh, and there's another one, um, other cyclists I've come across who all name their bikes. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I think it's nice. I think it's nice to say that I'm sharing the adventure with my equipment. <laughs> you're, only, you're only mate on the road. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's a couple of questions about e-bikes, as I predicted there would be. I think I mentioned to you, the, you're the first cyclist we've had, first speaker we've had who's done a tour on an e-bike, and it's been asked, requested several times. So I'm really glad that we've finally had a speaker who has done a significant tour on an e-bike. A couple of people have asked, was it easy enough to keep it charged? And um, the places that you stayed in, was it easy enough to charge them up in the places that you stayed in? Every night, I charged it full. Every single night, not a problem really straightforward you know the first question is have you got somewhere secure from my bike yeah and by the way i want to plug it in 
Uh, okay, it's a giant Explore One um, uh, e-bike, uh, and its range is uh, 90, 100 kilometers. Um, uh, that's fully laden. I'm carrying my two panniers and my paints uh, and the charger. Uh, okay, so that's roughly 25 kilos plus me. You know, it's a substantial piece of kit. It's you're not traveling on a little light uh, light bike. It's it's a big bike, uh, and so uh, you have to make sure that it's going to do the whole thing. There were a couple of occasions when I thought mm, I'm doing slightly more miles that I just better charge it up a little bit more over lunch, uh, uh, and you do. But but, but I, I loved it. Love the fact that you do not fear the hills. You don't look at them and think, oh, no. And, you know, the other thing is that when you get to the top of a hill and you're going down it, part of the joy of going down a hill is going, yay. You don't do that so much if you go at the bottom of that. I've got to go oh, up again. So so on an e-bike, you don't you, you go downhill safely you don't whiz as fast as you can go because you don't need to you you never worry about getting momentum going I, I, it liberates me it's just brilliant all our all of us uh, e-bikers who haven't go yeah love it absolutely certainly uh, uh the one the ones i've tried have been so much fun yeah awesome. they are fun they're good fun and the, the touring version where it, it built in i mean the thing is that the e-bikes are, are moving onwards and upwards. The latest version of, of the Giant Explore uh, bike, the, the 2021 bike, which Mrs. Mallet now has. Thank you very much to my good pal James at Spokes of Bagshot. Uh, he, um, it, 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 it's streets ahead of, um, of, of the bike from three years ago. The technology is always developing. Hmm, that's super. So another another fairly practical question, which is you obviously were traveling out of season and you said that you only booked one place ahead. Did you did you have many problems arriving at places that were already full and having to go on to the next town or was that not so much of a problem? And then I guess part of that as well is, was there an issue? I think the person who's asked this question has perhaps experienced it with having too many walkers on the road at the same time as you and having to dodge the walkers. So was that not an issue because you're out of season? Okay, this is sort of two questions there, the, 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 the walkers and the cyclists. There are, there's a, a walking track uh, which runs roughly parallel with the tarmac uh, and uh, you can pick and choose. In different areas or different Caminos, remember there's lots of different routes across, uh, across Spain, there are different, um, you yeah, know, look at those, look at all those routes there. Mm. See what I mean? So uh, the Camino Frances, that big uh, one that runs from um, Saint Jean over the Pyrenees, uh, uh, 900k, that's the popular one that has the thousands of, of pilgrims on. But the Via de la Plata from the south, from which uh, um, we did a few years ago in springtime, um, from Seville to Quesares, just a week, that was organized by um, a, a company who provide the hire bike, who sort out your accommodation, you tell them how far you're gonna cycle each day, and then they transport your bags. It's another way of doing it. So uh, for me, I didn't ever have a problem with uh, accommodation. Um, no, I, I didn't have that. I, I had, apart from the one when I got to the town, this was early on in France, and there's a couple of hotels and it was a, they were both full. Why? It's, it's a quiet little town. Oh, there's a there's an Ibis hotel 40k away. I said, on my bike. Well, somebody gave me a hand and found me um, a, a, a B and B, a Jeet, to stay at about 20k away, and I pedalled across the field to find it, and I did. Yay! I, I quite like the fact actually that you don't know where you're going to stay each night. That's part of it, isn't it? I think so. Uh, you, you don't know what you're going to find when you get there. And as long as you go in with a smile and a, and a good manners, I think you're going to get on OK, aren't you? Absolutely. Aren't you? And you can, you can always get, leave them the gift of a painting at the end, which is a lovely gesture. Thank you. Thank you. 
on the paintings, we've had a couple of questions about your paintings, um, as well as lots of praise for them. Um, somebody has said, this has been an utter pleasure and I found it very inspiring, thank you. Just too many questions. How long does it take you generally to paint a picture and do you paint from photos or do you always paint live? Uh, sometimes I'll do it from my sketches. You know, I showed you the, the, the sketchbook. So, you know, uh, I'll do a little, a, a quick little sketch over a cup of coffee. Uh, and then, um, I'll take some photos. Uh, I'll, um, if I'm going to work in my accommodation that evening, well, I get the photo on, on my phone. Right. Well, <laughs> I'm looking at the photo on the phone. Uh, but you can you can zoom in on the picture uh, to give you a little idea. But I've got a very good camera in my head. I, I I'm always looking at something. I'm always thinking, is that a view? I, I talked earlier on about a scene that was backlit, silhouettes, the hint of something. Ooh, I wonder what that shape says to you about something. And then I like colours. I mean, you'd expect me to like colours, wouldn't you? Um, if I'm there on the side of the road painting, I. A, a, an hour or so will get me the basics of that work and then I'll do some more in the accommodation or some of those were the bigger oil paintings of course I'm doing those back in my studio at home over the autumn and winter. Did, did you attract a lot of attention painting on the side of the road? People stop and look at what you were doing. I, I showed a photo there uh, standing by the side of the road painting on the back of the bike. And it was a lovely view of Lagrono, the capital of Rioja. So I knew I was going to be drinking that night. And it was a glorious view and a little lane. And um, a little van came up the lane and he wound down his window. And I went, hola, like you do. And he went, get out of the way. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> so you can attract attention. Sometimes it's not the attention you expect. <laughs> so um, I'm, I've counted five questions, all asking the same thing, which is what's, what's next? What's next? Any plans for another adventure? And are you going to paint it? Oh, certainly I'll paint it. Certainly I'll paint it. There's a bunch of ideas going around in my head. And funnily enough, this festival that you've run here, Laura, which has been an absolute joy to listen to and to watch, has been whetting the appetite. Uh, and there are a number of things, but you know, I, I'm not going to say what they are until I'm ready to do them. Because the mistake I made with the Camino was saying, I'm going to cycle the Camino from home alone. I love the idea of setting out from my house, pedaling all the way there, and back again. That's really important to me. It, it, it's absolutely the vital thing. And um, as the planning's going on, I'm well into the preparation. Just a comment from the family said, it would have been nice if you'd asked. Okay, so before I announce it, you know what, I'll run it by the family first and then hear all their reasons not to do it before saying I've got to do it anyway, so near. Nah. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what I do. Do you, when you go out in the UK, do you take your painting, do you take your paints with you? Um, I do. Uh, often in the UK cycle rides, I, I'm, I'm with uh, other people and I find it quite difficult to paint the view when I'm with others because I'm very conscious that they've got an agenda too and they want to get on and do the cycling. Uh, it's easier to do it on, on your own, but there's some lovely, lovely cycling. And I often find that when I'm cycling in the UK, that's the image. Okay, clickety-click, clickety-click, little sketch. I'm gonna work that out. Excellent. So it's half past nine and I'm conscious of time. So I just, I just pick, we've got lots of questions, but I'll just pick one or two um, to finish oh, off with. Okay. I'm fine, Laura. I'm, I'm fine. You're asking good questions and um, keep going. So, so one is a bit of fun from Kate Harvest. 
suspect her children have asked for this. We love your changing glasses. Um, how many pairs did you take? How did you choose which ones you wore? Did they reflect your mood for the day? Was it to match the scene you were painting? I took those. Um, I didn't take these, uh, but I did think about them. And, and there was a question as to whether I should take these. What do you think? Uh, so I think I had, uh, I think I had four pairs of glasses, including some sunnies, um, because you change your clothes every day, so change your glasses. Absolutely, absolutely. And there's quite a personal question, which I think is, um, we'll see if you if you're happy to answer it. But it's it's that this story was obviously extremely personal to you. You set off two days after Martin's funeral, and it, that really came across in the book. Um, and, and you know your, your reaction at the end when you got there and it was all the memory of Martin. Um, Amanda's written, I imagine it helped with your grief holding Martin in your heart and remembering him so beautifully, but did it make coming back difficult? Having, you know, you left the UK so soon after his funeral. Uh, I remember, uh, uh, I didn't realize it at the time, but pal Stevie, who was with me for the first couple of days said, you were all over the place, you know, you kept doing daft things going through the mud and taking the wrong detour uh, and and he made me slow down and the first day in France I said I'm not going to go anywhere I'm going to be a, I'm just going to cycle I'm going to paint so we're going to do a little tour around San Marlo and I'm going to paint two or three pictures which is what I did uh, uh, and he was the one who said when you put the Martin name tag share it on your social and I said I'm not doing that that's far too personal he said no do it he said because when there's no longer a google uh, or whatever the internet becomes if somebody finds a martin mallet name tag in squillion years they'll be able to look up the story and know what he meant and what his what his inspiration was and i thought that's rather nice and so I did. And whoa, I was quite surprised at the reaction. Uh, and it took me back a little bit. But it also gave me the courage to do those little videos, like the ringing of the bell, you know, and thinking Martin was a bell ringer. He's always going to be ringing that bell. Yeah. Mm. It added a lovely dimension to the book, actually, such a personal, such a personal dimension, which I imagine, was it fairly hard to write about that? The writing process was, uh, was a joy. OK, mm. so uh, SPCK, my publishers, and the editor said, right then, Timmy, um, I want 65,000 words, uh, end of July, Times New Roman, 12 point, one and a half line space, go, 3,000 words a chapter. What, 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 just get on with it. Uh, okay, and then my good pal Gary uh, gave me some little tips along the way of, of ways of ways to write things, I suppose. Uh, and I really in, enjoyed the whole process. It was rather nice to make it memoirs rather than autobiography. Autobiography is linear. I was born, I went to school, you know, I fell in love, here's my first job, the end. Okay, but memoirs are stories from your life. So that's why there's a bit of itsy bitsy and mallets, mallet and whackaday in my radio days and, and bits about my family. Um, and they pop up all over the place uh, and they don't have to be in order. That is a liberation. It's about being vulnerable again, isn't it? It's a liberation. I have to say, I really, I, I really liked that about your book. I've read a lot of cycle touring books and so many of them are the, are the linear journey and it gets quite repetitive. Whereas yours was, it was very, you did it very cleverly with the you. way you weaved everything together. It was well, one of the little tips somebody gave me early on was, tell me what I'm going to find in this chapter, please. So at the beginning of the chapter, give us a paragraph, two or three sentences that tells us what's going to happen. Oh, so did you see that? Did you spot that? No, I didn't actually. No, I'm, I have to reread it now. Have a little look at that. You're, you'll you'll okay. pick up that and open any chapter. And the, each of the chapters, you know, I, I put some line drawings in. Now that was the other thing that I really enjoyed. 
<laughs> so uh, they say um, start of each chapter, you've got some room for some line drawings, some black and white line drawings. Okay, you'll probably have room for two, three rows. So that'd be seven or eight drawings, 25 chapters, 250 drawings. Can we have them on Thursday? Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, there's nothing like a deadline to make things happen. Absolutely, panic stations. No, it's not panic stations. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm pleased with it. I'm pleased with the reaction from people who are reading it. And it seems to be resonating with people that we're all on this journey together. There's nothing unique or different. Uh, it's just our journey, isn't it? And that's what it's like on a cycle adventure. You, you've come across people who say, I, I've done this, I've done this. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's big news for them, isn't it? And absolutely, it's... absolutely. Which is, which is why I always say at the festival that we don't have headline speakers in the conventional sense because everybody who's been on a cycle journey has got a story to tell. And at the time they did that cycle journey, it was important to them and it was possibly the biggest thing they've done in their life. So, well, you know, we want to hear, we want to hear the story and how it's affected them. It's, it's, yeah. So uh, the the staying in the in the accommodation, you know, you know, you get used to the business of washing out your smalls each day, each day, and just doing your domestic stuff, and and rotating your clothes and take care of them. I, I quite, I, I found that quite liberating. No, <clears throat> not needing to carry very much, um, because whatever you take is fine for two weeks or two months, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, a, a couple of people have asked whether you were um, whether you experienced any low moments or whether any moments when you felt that you'd take bit up more than you could chew. Yes. Hmm. Yes, there were. Uh, um, some of those were quite early on in the vastness of um, the way of the Plantagenets. In that storm, am I bitten off more than I can chew here? Is this going to work? Or coming into um, an accommodation that seemed a wee bit odd. And coming across the pilgrim, Gretel from um, Ghent. And I said, is this, is this a bit odd? She said, I, I've done lots of these. She said, no, it's fine, it, it's okay. And that reassurance from somebody else was, was really nice. Um, having your phone means you can call or text. And I did get a phone call from my lovely friends, Robin and Judy, who are watching tonight. And I remember them saying, be kind to yourself. What, what do you mean? Just look, take time to be kind to yourself. Um, Terry said to me early on, he said, whatever you do when you're cycling, take a drink every 20 minutes, whether you want one or not, because you need to stay hydrated. And you know, you, if you're drinking enough, because you stop for a, you know, a splash and dash. Um, and he was right that when I didn't have some water, I got dehydrated and, and, and oh, I can't make a decision. Be kind to yourself. Uh, the other comment was these are the golden years, you know, where you can do it. There will, there may come a time when you're not able to do quite as much. Uh, and so if there's something you want to do, for God's sake, get out there and do it. Just do it. It's not a rehearsal, it's not a practice. It's not a jolly jaunt. This is it. This is the moment. It's not a dress rehearsal. You get one go. So just do it. Absolutely. And I think on that inspiring note, which is to me, that sums up the message of the Cycle Touring Festival. Just do it. Whatever bike you've got, whatever else you've got on in your life, just get on your bike and go. Right. Yeah. Um, so with, with that, I mean, I've just I've just enabled the chat because I suspect a lot of people would love to show their appreciation for you. So if anyone wants to just add a comment or a thank you message in the chat, then please do so that we can see your your love. And um, thank you, Timmy. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure to hear your story and, and what a superb speaker you are. Well, um, thank you so much. It's a, a real pleasure to share this story with you. And uh, Laura, are, are we going on a bike ride anytime soon with uh, your two little ones? 
Oh, I hope so. I hope, I'm hoping we'll see you at the festival one day, Timmy. I wanna, I'd love to show you the delights of Lancashire again. I know you, you know this part of the world. Well, it'll but, have, I'll have to pedal it there. Please do. Point. Please come up and join us. That will be the, uh, the thing. I would expect do. nothing less. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But I'm not one for, for camping at this stage. I'll, I'll have somewhere nice to stay, please. There is a, there's a and b on site. So, so there you go. Fantastic. Fantastic. Like that. But if not, then we'll see you. We'll see you in the south. I can occasionally, occasionally drag myself down south if I have to. Oh, splendid. Um, I've got a little thingy you might just want to see just while that's going through. How do I find that? How do I do? Keep talking a second while I just find this. OK, thing. thanks for all the amazing positive messages. Lots of people saying how life affirming your talk has been and how wonderful your talks are and how positive and what a brilliant way to end the festival. It's been um, absolutely superb. Thank you for a terrific oh. festival. Oh, that's <laughs> nice. That's Lovely nice. messages from people. Well, thank you so much. And thanks for inviting me, um, Laura. Really lovely. I'll play you this. Hang on. Uh, what do I hit? Is it going to be it's a bit satiny when you yellow polka dot bikini? Oh, I wouldn't dream of telling you what it's going to be. I'm, I'm, you'll wait and see. Uh, hang on. Press a button. Any button. It's a long way. <laughs> the thing is i can't ever go quietly on my bike it's never going to be a quiet cycle ride if you're with mallet <laughs> good good i think that's uh God bless you you. Ever... thank you so much for watching thank you thank you so much for for joining us real pleasure Good night, everybody, and thank you for joining in with the festival. It's been uh, great to have so many people join us this week. Take thank care. Thank you so much. See you soon. Bye bye. See you soon. Bye bye. It's a long way to Santiago. <laughs>